by other mothers. Rabbi Shapiro. Thank you, Vicki. Uh, good morning. Does this sound good? You can hear me? All right, so I just want to make one uh, correction to Vicki's introduction. I don't work with Richard Rohr. <laughs> if, that, if you need to leave now, that's fine. I understand. <laughs> I, I work with Gordon Pierman, who is better than Richard Rohr, actually. <laughs> okay. Richard Rohr has endorsed my book. He does use my material, but he doesn't pay for any of it. So, <laughs> that's all we're going to hear about Richard Rohr. We're, we're talking about the six most misunderstood passages of the Bible. The challenge for me was to come up with just six. <laughs> right? We could have done this forever, but I picked six. But I'm going to cheat, because as I talk about some of them, I'm going to weave others into it, so maybe it's more nine, or ten, or maybe even twelve. We'll see what actually happens. But I want to take a couple of minutes just to lay out the foundation so you know where I'm coming from and how we're going to be looking at this material. So how many of you, uh, I don't want to, let's see, how do I say this? How many of you take the Bible literally? Got, we got three, three people. <laughs> uh, four, now we got four. Do I get five? Do I have five people to live literally? <laughs> So, I don't. Okay, I think that the Bible is best read metaphorically. I'm going to go into that more deeply when we get to this little chart over here. And I'll be careful. I know you all can't see these things. They're mostly for my reference. So I, I make sure I get these points across. But I make some distinctions when I look at the Bible. And here are some of them. First, I make a distinction between truth and fact. I don't think they're the same thing. I think that there are some great, powerful, transformative, spiritual truths that you cannot prove factually. I think that the deepest wisdom that human beings experience is, is transmitted best through story than through history. So that's my second thing. Story, when I say the Bible is a collection of stories, and the Bible's a lot of other things too. It's law and it's ethics but, and some history, but primarily the parts of the Bible that speak to me the most powerfully are the parts that I understand as story and not history. So we're going to be looking next week at Adam and Eve. I don't think Adam and Eve were actual people. I think it's a story. Just like when Jesus tells the parable of the Good Samaritan, I don't think there was, a really, there was a real Samaritan that he had in mind. Right? That's why no one in the gospel says, what was his name, Jesus? Because <laughs> they all knew he was using this as a parable. When we try to communicate our deepest truths with, to, to, with one another, we do it through story, not through history. And then we argue about history, historians do, because you know, they say, well, you didn't get it actually right. But it's history. How can you get it wrong? Of course you can get it wrong, because it's really story. And people can read the stories in different ways. So I make this distinction between truth and fact. I think much of the Bible is true. Little of the Bible is fact. I think much of the Bible is story, and a little of it is history. Then I make a distinction between metaphorical and literal. When you read the Bible literally, you miss the depth of the text. When you read it metaphorically, it opens your, imagine, your imagination up to see multiple levels within the text. Does that make sense? You follow that? So you just need to know that about me, that this is where I'm coming from. I love the Bible, both but don't let this get out of this room here. Yeah? Both the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament, oh my God, I'll have to turn in my hat. <laughs> I love both of them and all the more heretical, I love the intertestamental books. All right, so you've got 
the 20-something books of the Hebrew Bible written by Jewish people. Then you've got the books of the New Testament. Almost all of them were written by Jewish people. And then in between, it's not like the Jews said, oh, let's take a break for a couple of centuries. <laughs> Jews write books. That's what we do. And so we kept writing them. But the rabbis didn't consider those books that were written after the can uh, canonization of the Hebrew Bible as divinely inspired books. They, were, they, were, they used them sometimes. They're interesting. Some of them are like the Maccabees books, the sort of historical books. But you get some really amazing teachings in the Greek apocrypha literature written by Jews in Alexandria, Egypt, where Greek was the lingua franca, the, the language of the time. And books like the Wisdom of Solomon, not to be confused with the Song of Solomon or the Song of Songs, which is erotic love poetry, but the Wisdom of Solomon, which has no eroticism in it at all, sadly, which is why we don't read it, because... <laughs> <clears throat> but it's an amazing philosophical text. And another one that goes along with it called Sirach, or the Wisdom of Sirach. These were written by Jews in Greek and are only available in uh, the, the Catholic Bible and the Orthodox Bible. If you're, a, if you're Jewish or you're Protestant, you don't have these as part of your Bible. And that's why I will suggest, though it's not part of this class, if you're looking to get a Bible, or have more than one, because translations are so different, at least one of your Bibles in the house ought to be the complete, of course I'm saying complete, uh, Hebrew Bible, New Testament, and the Apocrypha in between. So there are a lot of them available in English at the university. I used to teach Bible at uh, Middle Tennessee State. The standard university text was the New Revised Standard Version. So usually the Oxford Bible, the NRSV. The Bibles that I'm going to be using here, and hopefully you've brought your own and you have different translations, I'm going to be using uh, this one called the Stone Edition by the Art Scroll Company. And I'm using it because it has the Hebrew in it. And we're going to be working some with the Hebrew because I know you've already taken the advanced Hebrew class. <laughs> and you can do that. And then I'm also using, though, um, probably just a little today and then at the end, because one of the texts we're going to look at is the story of Barabbas. I'm using the Jewish annotated New Testament. And that is uh, also the NRSV Oxford. And I think that's uh, Amy Jill's commentary there. Let me look. Yeah, so Amy Jill Levine, you know, from Vanderbilt. And Mark Z. Brettler, who I don't have a clue who he is. Because all I care about is Amy Jill. <laughs> so, if you've brought other translations, you'll see different things, and you can bring them out in the Q&A, which will leave plenty of time for Q&A at the end. But I've been asked to just talk to you first before we get to the Q&A. My normal way of doing this is to have you interrupt me. That saves me from having to prepare. But <laughs> they said, no, that's not a good way to do it. So I'm going to lecture for a little bit, and then we'll open it up for conversation. Truth versus fact, I'm on the truth side. Story over, over history, I'm on the story side. I read the Bible metaphorically rather than literally, and that brings us to the rabbinic way of looking at text, which is a lot of what we're going to be doing. Now, I know you can't all see this, especially if I stand in front of it like that. So I will read this to you and help you understand it. The ancient rabbis said that there are four dimensions to every Bible verse, even word, even letter. Four dimensions to each of those. They said that each dimension has 70 facets. So if you brought a calculator, tell me what that means. So that's 280, thank you. So 280 legitimate already readings of every letter, word, verse, etc. And that <clears throat> there are, in each of those facets and on each of those four levels, over 1,200,000 legitimate interpretations. 
because they said that every person at Mount Sinai, and the Bible says there were 600 men of fighting age, so we double that by adding women and throw a few kids in there. There's got to be over you know, a million two people at the base of Sinai. Every one of those individuals received her own revelation. So there's not one way to read the Bible. With regard to this class, there's my way to read the Bible. <laughs> and then multiple incorrect ways of reading the Bible, which you're, you're free to entertain if you prefer. But when I talk about the misunderstanding of the Bible, it's not really that I'm telling you the truth. I'm just giving you another one of those interpretations. But I'm choosing texts that are so ingrained in our memory, in our psyche, that we think we know them and we don't, especially when you look at the multiple levels. So let me just tell you what the levels are. The first one is called Peshat, so P-E-S-H-A-T. It means the simple reading of the text. That's the literal reading of the text. If the Bible says that the world was created in six days, you cannot say, the Bible says the world was created in three days and 12 hours, right? You can't make up or replace what's written in the printed text. You have to work with what's written. So the literal is not thrown out, it's just the foundation. So you have to take the Bible at, no pun intended, at its word, right? But that's just the foundation. As soon as you understand what the literal is, and when you're studying this in a, I grew up in an Orthodox home, by the time you're, you're eight years old, you're expected to move beyond the literal. So when you move beyond the literal, you're in the world of remez, R-E-M-E-Z. It means hint. And the idea from the rabbis, now this is thousands of years old, but the idea of the rabbis was that the Bible is in fact the word of God. But God cannot tell us everything that God wants us to know just in this literal reading of the book. It's just too much. So God puts hints in the text that say to you something else is being taught here beyond the literal. So an example that we won't be dealing with just so I can throw it out to you, when Abraham and Isaac and the two servants go to, uh, you know, Abraham's taking Isaac to sacrifice Isaac, and they get to the base of the mountain, and then Abraham says to the servants, you guys wait here, and the boy and I will go up, and we will come back down. We'll go up and sacrifice, and we will come back down. Now, if you've been reading the verses before that, you know that Isaac isn't coming back down. Abraham intends to kill him up there. I've had teenage son. I, I have that feeling once in a while. You know? <clears throat> so why does Abraham say, we will come back down? So the text is wrong, right? Literally, it makes no sense, because he's lying now to the servants. And if Isaac is paying attention, he's lying to Isaac. And according to Jewish tradition, Isaac is 30 years old. He's not a little kid. So, why would he do that? At the level of remez, hint, doesn't say. It just says, look, there's a hint in the text that some other dynamic is at play. Once you see one of these hints, you go into the third level. It's called drosh, that's the verb, or midrash, that's the, the noun. So, drosh, yeah? So, oh, didn't I, I'm sorry. Uh, midrash, or drash is D-R-A-S-H, and midrash, the noun, is M-I-D-R-A-S-H. Thank you. So, this is where your imagination clicks in. Literal is what's printed. The hint, the remez, is what's printed, but it makes no sense. And then drash is how do you make sense from, what do, what do you get out of the hint? Right, so the hint is, 
Abraham's lying. Why would he lie? So just off the top of your head, you can probably think of some reasons. One of the standard ones is he doesn't want Isaac, who's not a little kid, he's 30 years old, he doesn't want Isaac to know that Isaac isn't coming back down. Right? Because, yep, boy and I are going up. I'll be back in a little while. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> if you're Isaac, it's like, well, <clears throat> Dad, remember me? What do I do? So maybe he's just trying to protect Isaac from, you know, doesn't want Isaac to rebel against this idea of being sacrificed. Another one says, Abraham is telling the truth. He and Isaac are going to come back down because Abraham has no intention of killing this, his son. So they make stories about that. Midrash is, because that's not in the Bible, I'm just saying that. That's Midrash. That's, you might call it fan fiction, where you take the characters of the Bible and you spin more stories. There's a wonderful one, because when you read after the non-sacrifice of Isaac, because he doesn't do it, Abraham, in fact, comes down alone. Isaac is not with him. It's another hint. What happened to Isaac? So part of the, the Midrashic imaginative reading of the Bible is Isaac realizes that his father is nuts, <laughs> that he is psychotic, that he was going to kill you know, he heard a voice that said, kill his son, he was going to do it. And then he heard another voice that said, don't do it, so he didn't do it. So you can imagine Isaac going, you know, I can't trust this guy. Is he on his meds or is he off his meds? <laughs> so Isaac, but also the Midrash says, Isaac realized that this was not the first time Abraham set out to kill a son because he sent Hagar and her son Ishmael out in the wilderness with only one day's food and water, knowing they were going to die. Now they don't, God saves them in the story, but Abraham doesn't know that. So Isaac remembers this, this family tale, and he thinks, wow, I didn't appreciate my older brother, but now I realize we're both dealing with psychotic father, so the reason Isaac doesn't come back with Abraham is that Isaac goes down the other side of the mountains, according to the Midrash, goes down the other side of the mountain in search of Ishmael. And then the Bible finds Isaac back in the story when he and Ishmael together go to Abraham's funeral. And so there's all these stories. What were they doing? Right? So that's Midrash. And it's all from your imagination because you've got the revelation too. And we have, I mean, I've got in my office volumes, I mean, longer than what my arms can hold, of, of collected midrash from 1,500 and older and more years ago. Sometimes, when your imagination is firing and you're coming up with all these insights, sometimes you stumble on something that seems to come from beyond your imagination, something you never would have thought of. And that's called sod. That's the fourth of the four, S-O-D. It means secret or mystery. <clears throat> this is a revelation that comes to you that is, you didn't hear it anywhere else. It, it's not like you're playing with the text and, and something that you can imagine. You know, oh yeah, he lied because he didn't want to upset Isaac's feelings. That's that's a psychological thing we can understand. But sometimes something comes out in your, through your imagination, but from beyond the imagination. And that's called sowed. That's a secret thing that no one ever heard of, at least you never heard of before. And if you share it, it becomes midrash, because part of the collection. But the experience of it itself comes from beyond the egoic mind. It's another kind of revelation. So just to stick with the story we've got, there, what, now it's Midrash, but uh, there is a whole... Ex someone had the experience that the voice on the top of the mountain that said, don't kill Isaac, was not God's voice, but Sarah's voice. That Sarah knew what Abraham was going to do, raced ahead of her husband and her son. And she's, she's like 99 years old. She, she drags, um, no, she's, she's 120, so she's, she's 120 years old. She drags a ram up the mountain with her, ties it in a bush, waits for Abraham and Isaac to show up, waits for Abraham to tie Isaac on the, 
the altar he made, and then calls out, Abraham, Abraham, what's wrong with you, you idiot? <laughs> you know, don't do it. Abraham, who's for some reason just willing to listen to any voice that isn't his own, <laughs> you know, imagines it's God and the story goes on. So someone came up with that and that was at the time a mystical thing about the divine feminine and you know, who knows where, what, what they do with that. But it's the fourth level of teaching. So you got the idea? You start with the literal, then you find things wrong with the text, then you open those things up with your imagination, creating new stories, and then sometimes the stories seem to come from a place beyond your imagining. We're going to be playing primarily with the remez and the drosh. If you get some kind of personal revelation, you should let us know. <laughs> but you're not going to hear that from me. Because if I get a personal revelation, I'm not sharing it with you, I'm going to put it in a book and make some money. <laughs> so we're going to look at the literal, we're going to find the problems with it, the hints that there's something deeper, and then I'm going to share with you some of the deeper things that are part of the Jewish way of reading the text. Uh, let me correct that. Part of a Jewish way of reading the text. There is no, in Judaism, no the Jewish way. Right? Even though we have chief rabbis in Israel and in England, they don't agree with one another. There's nobody in charge of Judaism. Right? So every Jew is wrestling with this stuff herself, himself, coming up with their own understandings because there are 1.2 million revelations with all their 248, 248 derivations of those 1.2 million revelations. So there's enough possibility that you don't really have to argue about it, but you, you, you just want to add more and more to the ones you know. <clears throat> so what we're going to be dealing with is not the Jewish understanding, but a Jewish understanding of these texts. And the reading that I'm going to share with you, I mean, the, the way these are understood, I think frees the text from the narrow-minded, conventional way that you and I have been reading them all our lives. Even if you're Jewish, chances are the stuff that I'm going to share with you, starting in two seconds, is stuff you've never heard. What is that? Is that an airplane? All right. Maybe they're coming here. We should wait to see if they're coming to class. We don't want them to miss this. All right. So is that, is that clear? I'll take, if, if someone's lost, I'll, I'll entertain a question or two just on this. But you, you get the idea? All right. Then let's get to the text itself. So we're going to look at the creation story, Genesis 1, 1. We're going to pick up Adam and Eve next week. But we're just looking Actually, not even at the whole story, we're just looking at the first two verses. So I can hear pages turning. We all have different translations. I can't tell you what page you're on, but I can tell you you're looking for the book of Genesis, chapter 1, <laughs> verse 1, wherever that may be in your book. So what have you got? What, what's your English translation? Let's work with the, the translations here. Well, just read the first three words. What do they say? In the, in the beginning. Anyone have anything other than in the beginning? What have you got? When God began. When God began. Anybody have something else? First, Sorry? First this, God? first, this God? Oh, the Message Bible, the Message Bible. Okay. So, the Message Bible is a great Bible to read, but it's got nothing to do with the actual text, because it's not a translation, it's interpretive reading uh, for, to make the Bible easier to read. So, this isn't going to work well with the Message Bible. Uh, so, most of us have, uh, you, you said what, when God? Yeah, when God began. Yeah, so the inter they're all interpretations, because they're all translations. So the, that's the first thing we're going to discover, is that whoever translates text always translates text in their own image, after their own likeness. And I, I've translated a lot of Bible text, and that's how it's done. 
or at least that's how I do it. <laughs> but I'm going to be comparing the Hebrew with the English just a little bit so you can see why all of our English translations are wrong. And I have the same thing. In the beginning, it's wrong. The first three words are wrong. Now in Hebrew, it's one word. It's, and you'll have to just hear it, bereshit. Bereshit, the b sound is what our translators render in the. But if it really said in the, it would be ba reshit. The Hebrew is b, b apostrophe. In the would be b a. But it's not that. It's b apostrophe. What's the difference? B with an apostrophe means with a. With a maybe beginning. I'm going to take that away from you too. But with a beginning. So there are many commentators on the Jewish side who say with a beginning. Well, how many beginnings were there? And they say there were an infinite number of beginnings. God kept trying it and it didn't work, so he tried again. And he just kept, it was trial and error until he got this one, which was still an error, but it worked okay. Right? I mean, we're going to read John 1.1 1, 1 in a little bit. And, you know, John 1.1 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the word, and my own sense of the word was, oops. Right? <laughs> so, but that's not really what it is. But, so don't write that. Rabbi says, no, that's... So it's with a beginning, or by means of a beginning. And the word beginning that we're translating as beginning is reishit. This is Hebrew, you know, R-A-Y-S-H-E-E-T, just to get the sound right. So it's B apostrophe, R-A-Y-S-H-E-E-T, B reishit. By means of reishit, and then we always say God created heavens and the earth. That's not the Hebrew, though. The Hebrew, if we read it literally, it says, Bereshit, by means of Reshit, created Elohim, God, Shemayim, heavens, the Haaretz, earth. By means of Reshit, whatever Reshit is, created God, heaven, and earth. God is a creation along with heaven and earth. Do you, do you hear that? The English <clears throat> inverts it and makes God the subject of the verb created. But the Hebrew puts it in a different order so that God, Elohim, is the object, one of the things, along with heaven and earth, that was created by means of reshit. So let's see if we can figure out what this means. That's the literal. Obviously something must be going on here that isn't... In, in the literal. Oh, and here's our first problem of the day. This is a write-on, not wipe-off board. So if somebody can go get water, I think, maybe on a paper towel from the restroom, <clears throat> maybe I can clean this off. Because otherwise it's going to be a hard for you to follow what I'm saying. So the question is, We'll get to the God thing, which is a little bit more complicated. Well, oh, great. What have you got? I used to work for CBS television in New York. I was a consultant. One time I was giving this talk to a group of employees, and I had the same problem. I needed an eraser. They had to send... That's perfect. Thank you very much. I needed an eraser. Three guys came. <laughs> Literally, three guys. One to carry the eraser. <laughs> that was his job. Another one to actually erase the board. I could not do it. I wasn't in the board erasing union. <laughs> and the third person to manage the other two. <laughs> now, I am into unions, but now you can see why we have right to work states, because it just went too far. It just went too far. Three people to bring me an eraser. Thank you. Are you in the uh, union? <laughs> he said his assistants aren't here today. He had to do it himself. Okay. So let's start. What is this reshit 
character, by means of reshit. So the, the only way to know this is you have to look at other parts of the Bible where it says that the beginning of creation was something else. And if this is, the, Rashid is saying what happens in the beginning, what's the something else? This will, make, this will be clear in a sec. You can even go to, to John 1.1, 1, 1, where John says, in the beginning was the word. <clears throat> the Hebrew, the English is not accurate. The Greek is, in the beginning was logos, right? Not logos. <laughs> That's like America, right? In the beginning, you have to have a logo, and then you have to have a website, but that's not what it said. It was logos, it's Greek for wisdom. And the original word would have been, in Greek, Sophia, and in Hebrew, Chachma. And we'll see her in a second. So, <laughs> okay. This is just, now at the board is too wet, and I can't get it to write. Yeah, I can't. Okay, so Chachma is C-H-O-M-A-H. -H. It means wisdom. Sophia, S-O-P-H-I-A, is Greek for the same word. Chachma, Sophia, same thing. They both mean wisdom. In both languages, Hebrew and Greek, because both Hebrew and Greek are gendered languages, unlike English, Sophia and Chochmah are women. They're, it's a feminine noun. And the Bible, when the Bible speaks in Hebrew, you can't tell necessarily in English, depends how honest the translators are. When the Bible speaks of wisdom, it's always in the feminine. The verbs are feminine. That's how you know, well, and the nouns are feminine. So, if you turn to the book of Proverbs, Now I sound like a televangelist. <laughs> so now listen to this. You can turn to the book of Proverbs. I want you to turn to chapter 8, verse 22. Now pay attention. So book of Proverbs. Now if you're looking at a Jewish Bible, it's near the end of the book. If you're looking at a Christian Bible, it's in the middle of the book. Not because of where the New Testament is, but because of where the prophets show up. In the Hebrew Bible, you get the five books of Moses, the Torah. Then you get the prophets. Then you get what we call Ketuvim, the, the anthology of writings. Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, things that don't fit into either the five books of Moses or the prophets. But in Christian Bibles, the, church, the early church fathers changed the order, and they went from the five books of Moses to the writings, you know, Ruth, etc., to the prophets. And then, unless you have intertestamental literature like you do in the Catholic and uh, Anglican and, and Orthodox Bibles, it goes right into the New Testament. The reason they do that is because they read the Hebrew prophets as prophesying about Jesus. So it makes more sense. Right, that you go, you end your Hebrew Bible with the prophets who are saying somebody is coming and then you turn the page and that somebody is Jesus. The rabbis who put the Bible together centuries before Jesus, they didn't know about, you know, they, th that was not their issue. So they put the prophets in the middle because that's how they saw it chronologically. That the people settled the land, they established the kingdom, the prophets, the kings go bad, the prophets come out and, and try to correct things, and then you've just got all these other books that they didn't know what to do with, so they stuck them in the end. <clears throat> so, if you're, in the, if you're looking at a Jewish Bible translation, it's near the end of the book. If you're looking in the Christian Bible translation, it's in the middle. But either way, it's Proverbs chapter 8, verse 22. Drum roll. God made me, whoever me is, as the beginning of his way. Now, the me, if you read earlier in verse 12, 
is defined. I am wisdom. Now, in English, that tells you nothing. But in Hebrew, I am Chachma. In Greek, I am Sophia. I am Lady Wisdom. Because it's feminine. And wisdom is always referenced in Hebrew in the feminine. So, when we get to verse 822, it's this woman speaking. Now, that's rare in, such a, in the Bible. That out of nowhere, suddenly, this woman is speaking. But she's, she's talking to us. She tells you that, you know, I am wisdom in, in 12, and, and she goes on. But in 22, she gives us another version of creation that will define what the race sheet is, what the beginning is in Genesis 1.1. You with me? You find, we'll see where I'm going? It says, God made me as the beginning of his way. The beginning, race sheet is Chachma. Reishit, the first thing that, that the, the thing that is the catalyst for creation in the Reishit, or by means of Reishit, Elohim was created, heavens were created, earth was created, God, heaven and earth were created. By means of Reishit, in this passage, you know what she tells you, I'm Reishit because that's the Hebrew. So now you could go back to Genesis 1.1 and read it by means of lady wisdom were created, or if I were going to do it, were birthed, because now we're talking about a woman. By means of lady wisdom came forth gods, Elohim, but I'm going to get rid of that word in a minute. <laughs> Elohim, heavens and earth. There is something behind wisdom, right? Because she's the, the, the first. There's, there's a God behind the creator, which we'll deal with in a sec. But the actual creation, it comes from a woman. <laughs> because show me a man who's given birth to anything. It makes no sense. The people who wrote the Bible are not stupid. They are, I, in my estimation, they are brilliant authors. They're brilliant thinkers. They're brilliant writers. There's a, um, he's retired now, but at, at Yale University, uh, Harold Bloom was a major English scholar you know, scholar of English literature, but also of the Bible and of various mystical traditions, Jewish and otherwise. And he has a book out, or wrote a book, called The Book of J. And J is, is um, the German letter that stands for Y in English, which stands for the letter Yud in Hebrew, which stands for God. And it's one of the names of God that we'll deal with uh, next week, because it's in the second um, creation story. But in this story, we use Elohim. Elohim, which scholars call E, and the unpronounceable name of God, but scholars call it Yahweh, okay, because uh, of, or Jehovah in the German, so they call it J. In Harold Bloom's book of J, he argues that all the early stories in Genesis were written by women for women in King David's court, that there, were this, there was this group of educated, um, literary, literarily inclined women who had a club, and they would write these stories and share them. And most of the stories they wrote made fun of men. <laughs> and, and we'll see the major one next week when we deal with Adam. But they made fun of men. And for their own entertainment. And then somehow, their joke stories become the Holy Bible, right? So these things that were just sort of monologues making fun of guys, the guys didn't get it, and they used it to oppress women, among others, and create the religions of the patri or patriarchal religions. So it's, it's a quirky thing. And you can accept that or not accept that. It's irrelevant 
to the point I'm making, which you must accept, <coughs> because I'm up here and you're not. So let me see if you get the idea. So Genesis 1, by means of a beginning, were created God, heavens, and earth. In Proverbs 8, she says to us, I am the beginning. Now, if you believe that the Bible is the word of God and that different parts of the Bible are talking and elucidating one another, which is the basic Jewish assumption, then you have a proof text that says, oh, I get it. That's why it doesn't say in the beginning, but by means of a beginning, because the a beginning isn't a time, it's a person. Lady Wisdom. And then she tells you, because I'll read on a little bit, because she tells us more about herself. Uh, I have reigned for all time. She's right there from the beginning, from before there was the earth. When there were no depths, I was formed. When there were no pools rich with water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills, I was formed. When God had not made the earth and its environs or the first dust of the inhabit, uh, in, inhabited world, she was there, right? Because she's, by means of her, everything is happening. When he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he etched out the globe upon the face of the depths, when he uh, strengthened the heavens above, when he fortified the wells, the well springs of the depths, when he blah, 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 blah. I, now, my translation says, I was then his nursling. Now, that's, the Hebrew is not clear what that means. So it could mean, it could be nursling, it could mean young child, or it could mean architect slash builder. So in the Jewish mystical tradition, it's builder. That I was there from the very beginning, or before there was a beginning, because I am the beginning, and I was stood by God and I built the universe. And there's, in those um, intertestamental books I mentioned, there's a text that says that when God set about to create the world, God took counsel with, God referenced the Torah, which is also feminine, which is a synonym for wisdom. So she's the birth mother of the whole thing. She's the birth mother of the whole thing. Now, you've never heard that at church, right? You've never heard that in a normal synagogue. Because right? this is the mystical stuff. This is from the Midrash level of things. The hint is the B throws us off by means of Reishit, not in the beginning, but by means of this thing called Reishit. That's the hint something else is going on. The answer here, you don't even need your imagination. You just need to know what else is in the Bible. And you go to, to verse 8, 22, and you discover it's a woman. It's Sophia. Chachma. Eventually, and it takes centuries, but eventually the woman becomes, or, or Sophia becomes Logos. And that's a Jewish thing. It happens in, in the, it's not a Christian thing. Philo does it, and Philo's pre-Jesus, where the feminine is, the feminine Chachma slash Sophia is now referenced as Logos. And that's why John 1.1 1, 1, says in the beginning um, was the, the Logos, and the Logos was with God, and Logos was God, and then Logos becomes enfleshed in Jesus. If John said in the beginning was Sophia, and Sophia becomes embodied in Jesus, now we've got a very heavy Jungian <laughs> text to work with, that the feminine becomes the masculine, um, which is part of early Christian mysticism, but that's a whole other lecture series. So, so John doesn't have to deal with that, because by John's time, first century CE, common era, by John's time, the language has already made the shift within the Jewish community, because he's writing, you know, this is coming out of the Jewish world. The language has already shifted from feminine to masculine, so it fits Jesus without a, a hitch. But in the earlier text, centuries earlier text, it's clearly the feminine. So by means of this feminine wisdom being, 
who she says, this is the first thing God manifests. First God creates her, then she creates the rest. From her, we get Elohim, Shemaim, and Haaretz, literally gods, heavens, and earth. So God is created. So the word we're talking for God here is Elohim. So in English, E-L-O-H-I-M. So the rabbis look at this text and they say, what? How can God be created? It's a problem. So this is a hint that there's something else going on here. Now, the Bible has multiple words for God. In the second story that we look at next week, the word for God is the Y-H-V-H, the yod heh vav heh But in this text, we get Elohim, so, which is plural. When you have a word with the im at the end, the I-M at the end, it's, it's plural. So it's literally, by means of Lady Wisdom, were created gods, heavens, and earth. The earth is singular, heavens is plural, gods is plural. So the rabbis are not happy with this. What could this mean? So the rabbis have this tool at their disposal called gematria. So G-E-M-A-T-R-I-A. It's a Greek word and it means numerology. The Hebrew Bible only, um, the Hebrew language has no numbers. You know, like we use one, two, three, four, five, those are Arabic numerals. You go to a movie and they use Roman numerals to tell you when the movie was copyrighted. Hebrew has no numerals. It just has consonants. So they have to come up with numbers somehow so what they do is they simply take the letters and they give them numerical value. So Aleph is the first letter, it's, worth, it's the number one. Bet, B is the second letter, it's number two. Gimel is the third letter, it's number three. So they just go from one to ten, then they go from ten, then they count by tens, and then they count by hundreds, and somehow they make the whole thing work so they can put together whatever numbers they need. From the interpretive point of the Bible, at the third level, Midrash, you are invited to read the Bible not only as language, but as math, numbers. In fact, there's one tradition in Judaism that says that the Bible isn't what we read in the stories at all. God put this, the Bible together. The Bible is, in fact, a mathematical formula for creating universes. But because we'll never remember, because it's a long <laughs> formula, knowing that we've never remembered the math, God put it in story form so that we can recover the math if we ever want to create our own universe. Uh, and there's all kinds of stories from the Talmud, which go back you know, 2,000 years, where rabbis know how to do that, but not the whole universe thing. There's a story, I, I just like this one. The rabbis study from Sunday to Friday, then they have to race home, and this one rabbi promised his wife that he would bring home chicken, and then he forgot, and he's almost home, and he knows if he doesn't have chicken, they have nothing to eat, so he simply uses the math for chicken to make a chicken. <laughs> <laughs> because if you know the numbers, according to that tradition, you can actually if you know the math, you know the formula, you can actually make the thing appear. That's where the word abracadabra comes from. In Hebrew, it's, in Hebrew, it's, uh, it, it's a Hebrew phrase. It means um, uh, adaber is, is to, to speak, and then the thing happens. So it's, because the word for speak and the word for thing in Hebrew are, are the same, basically. So you speak the thing into existence. And the, in this tradition, it was, you spoke the math, and then pff, you got the bird. For our purposes, if you want to eat chicken for lunch, just go buy chicken. I'm not going to, I don't know how to make a chicken, and I'm a vegetarian, so I don't even know the math. But this is how you use the math to understand the Bible. 
The word Elohim, if, and I won't bother you with the math, but the word Elohim, if you add up the letters, the numbers, comes to the number 86. The rabbi said any words that share the same numerical value can, if it helps you understand the text, can be read as synonyms. So there's a word in Hebrew, and I don't know if you can see this down here, but I'll spell it for you. H-A-T-E-V-A, -E Hateva. Anyone have Teva sandals? Yeah. Right? So it's an Israeli company. Teva means nature. So Hateva is like nature with a capital N, the nature, the natural world. So the, the word Hateva for the natural world, the value of Hateva, luckily for the rabbis, is 86. Nature is diverse. Nature is, is you know, multiple manifestations of nature. If, the, if words with the same number value can be read as synonyms, then what the Bible could be saying, and of course it's could, because there's 1.2, you know, right? All these millions and millions of, of possibilities. What the Bible could be saying is, by means of wisdom, were created Elohim, but as a synonym, were created the natural world, the cosmos, and then Earth herself. It takes the, it makes it a, a, a more, well, I, mean, I don't know if secular is the right word, but it makes it a more scientific text, right? It's not that God created anything, but some internal intelligence, wisdom, lady wisdom, some intelligence, ordered the universe in such a way that nature, in, in the biggest sense, happens, and then nature then continues as the cosmos and the earth that we're sitting on. That is what a midrash does. Now, th I didn't, I mean, this, I'm just telling you these old things. This is, I'm not making this up. This is part of the stand, well, what do you say, standard? Part of the Jewish way, the large Jewish way of looking at at texts. So that's why the class is called Misunderstood, because you never heard this. This is right. Your way is wrong. <laughs> You're misunderstanding it. But you, you follow the idea? So in, by, the, by means of wisdom comes nature, and nature includes the, the heavens and the earth. And that's why Elohim is plural, because nature is plural. Nature is plural. Now, what else do we know about wisdom? She tells us, and I won't go into detail because I want to get to Q&A because this is really the point. Um, she says, I was talking about God here. She says, I was God's delight every day, playing before him at all times, playing in the inhabited areas of his earth. My delights are with my book, being as sexist as it is, the, the sons of man, but the Hebrew could be read children of humanity. Wisdom is engaged with her creation. She plays before God, and, and creation then becomes an expression of her play, and her ultimate delight is us. And you'd have to read my books on, on Lady Wisdom. The, the bottom line is she never leaves us. That when you have an experience of God in the Jewish world, the languaging in the Jewish world, is you experience what they call Shekhinah, S-H-E-C-H-I-N-A-H, Shekhinah, which means God's presence, what becomes the Holy Spirit in Christianity. When Jesus says, um, whenever two or more are gathered in my name, you know, the Spirit rests upon them, that's uh, his version of an older text where the rabbis say, how many people do you need to experience God? And someone says 10, and someone says 9, and they get it down to 1. And if you're engaged in some kind of spiritual practice, the rabbis are saying the study of Torah, which is feminine, you're engaged with the divine feminine in book form, you can experience Shekhinah, which is feminine, the presence of God as this feminine force, wisdom, and when wisdom speaks to you, if you hear her voice, the rabbis use the term 
bat, B-A-T, kol, K-O-L. Kol means voice. Bat, like bat mitzvah, means daughter. Where in Christianity, God, if you're going to hear the voice of Jesus, you hear a male voice. In Hollywood, you hear the voice of um, Charlton Heston or the voice of George Burns. But in the ancient Jewish world, you heard a woman's voice because you heard the voice of Chachma Sophia, Lady Wisdom. Wisdom is constantly guiding us, and she loves us, she delights in us, and she is a woman, which is just not the way either Judaism or Christianity panned out, you know, with, um, with the focus on the feminine. It didn't do that. But in the Midrashic world, the feminine reasserts herself. Last point I want to make before we open it up. So then we back to Genesis 1, 1. So by means of Rashid, which is Lady Wisdom, by means of wisdom, we get heavens and earth and all that. Then it said, just to stick with verse 2, now my book is not good. My book says, the earth was astonishingly empty. <laughs> That's not a real good translation of the Hebrew. So we know that the universe comes from this divine mother figure, who in turn comes from God, and we'll, we'll talk about that God next, next time. But the, na- the, the planet, the, the universe as, that she's working with, the Hebrew is tohu, T-O-H-U, um, and vohu, V-O-H-U, tohu vavohu. I mean, the V with the apostrophe is just and. So, tohu and vohu, V-O-H-U. Tohu vavohu means wild, chaotic. It can't hold form. It's just like something's, you know, something arises and then it dissipates right away. It has no stability whatsoever until God, not Lady Wisdom, until God speaks and creates order out of it, uh, correction, order over it. Lady Wisdom gives us the wild, but then God speaks and places order over it. So it says, I mean, you've heard this a million times. So uh, God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God said, let's separate the light from the darkness. And God said, let the firmament, in, let there be a firmament, you know, dry land in the midst of the waters, and let it separate what... God speaks 10 times in the beginning to give us the world that you and I experience. But what God doesn't do in the Hebrew Bible is get rid of tohu vavohu. Now, there are other creation stories where there's a dragon and the hero kills the dragon and out of the carcass of the dragon you make the universe. Dragon symbolizes chaos, tohu vavohu. Or the dragon is, a, or the, the chaos is a crazy god, and the hero kills the god, and out of the god's skull, the universe is created. In the Hebrew Bible, nothing stops chaos. God does not defeat chaos. God simply places a layer of order over the chaos. Underneath the reality that you and I experience, it is wild unformed, chaotic, and ready to break through into your life in amazing and often horrifying ways over which you and I have no control. In the book of Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes calls it Hevel, H-E-V-E-L. Hevel, in your English translations, vanity of vanities, futility upon futility. That's not Hevel. That's the translator. Hevel means in, substan- in, in tra- um, impermanent. Impermanent. The word comes from vapor or breath. The world that you and I experience is like a vapor or like morning dew. It arises, but then poof, it can dissipate in, in a minute. So what... The Genesis author calls tohu vavohu, wild and chaotic. 
Ecclesiastes calls Hevel. Everything is not vain. Everything is fundamentally outside your control. When you say, why did this happen to me? And the this could be the death of a loved one or the winning of the lottery. It doesn't matter because the answer is always, who the hell knows? <laughs> it's just madness underneath the surface. Now you and I live in a linguistic universe. Language is how we make sense out of things. And we want a world that's ordered. So we create ideologies and uh, isms and theologies and religions, all out of language to make the world a safe place. But Genesis and later Ecclesiastes, Genesis is telling you it's not safe, it's wild. And Proverbs, when she speaks to us, says that she's playing. Now, Hebrew doesn't help us here. Hebrew, what, what helps us here, and now I'm just going to give you this and then I'm going to let it go because it's way out of. Sanskrit helps us here. So in the Hindu tradition, they say the world is maya. And we usually translate maya as illusion. But that's absurd. The world is not an illusion. You're sitting here. The person next to you may be an illusion, but you're not. <clears throat> it depends, again, if you took your meds, right? But the Hindus say the world is maya. And what maya means is a magic trick. So if you go see a magician, a good one, right? They're doing something. When they make an elephant disappear, they're actually making the elephant disappear, but just not the way they, they want you to think they did it, right? So something is actually happening, but they're distracting you, and then you buy into the system that, that's the illusion, the maya. But in the Sanskrit, when you see through the illusion, you end up seeing lila, which is play. So the illusion is this ordered universe, but if we can look beneath it, we see the wildness of Lady Wisdom's play. But she loves us. The play is not to, to harm us. The play is just the nature of reality. And if you read the rest about Lady Wisdom, she's always out there trying to, I mean, she, I mean she, she's the prototype of what Jesus does. Where Jesus has a male apostles, she has female apostles. She, where Jesus had the, the, the various feasts that he you know, brought people together and, and fed people. She does the same thing, but she does it centuries earlier. So she's with us, she's among us, she cares for us, she's nurturing us, she invites you to her feast, it says in the, in the book of Proverbs, and she has these seven pillars of wisdom that she wants us to know, but it doesn't spell out what they are. But when you know her, you know the world is play. It's not a negative thing, it's just not the nice, neat world that you and I thought into existence, that you and I want to be true. That when we wake up in the, in the morning, we want the world to go the way our, our day planner says it's supposed to go. And then it doesn't. Okay, so I'm going to stop. And I will repeat questions if you have them. And we'll see if this makes sense. Yeah. Oh, okay. I've got a, a volume of different ways of reading Elohim. So I, I can't go through them. There's too many. But there are dozens and dozens of them. Um, Elohim could simply be, uh, the reason Elohim is in the plural could simply be that it's the royal we. They talk about that. Um, later on, when, when God, in the second story for next week, God talks about let us create. You know, is the us Elohim, because Elohim is plural, or is the us the masculine deity and the feminine wisdom character? So, so it's plural because there's more dimensions to him than, than a singular noun would work. The, the original word is El, E-L, that means God, but in the ancient time, maybe, maybe it's plural because they were trying to encourage all the different gods. You know, when before Muhammad took over the Kaaba, the central box in, in Mecca, the box contained all the gods of all the different peoples. And they would have spoken of God in the plural. But then he got rid of them, and, and now there's nothing in there because there's just one God. So maybe it reflects a time when there were just multiple gods. But I don't know. 
I, I don't know. The one that speaks to me is, is this one. Um, other comment, question? Yeah, no, they told me no comments, only questions. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, if you go back pre-Hebrew uh, culture, you find that you've got feminine creation, uh, feminine creator deities in Egyptian culture, in Canaanite culture, and then, do I think this is an add-on? I think this is an extension of. I think that there is and, and you can read Joseph Campbell stuff about this and, and others, there is a substratum of the divine feminine figure throughout human history, old, and it's older than the masculine God. Because before people got into patriarchy, it was matriarchy, and the God reflects the matriarchal setup, so women were on, you know, were the superior characters. So the goddesses were, had more power. But you can't keep a good goddess down, and so she's always there in Judaism. She comes out more powerfully in the mystical side of things. Uh, though this notion of the daughter's voice, I mean, that's standard rabbinic. In Christianity, uh, you get in, in um, Yaakov Burma, who's a German Christian mystic, he never says Christ, he only says Christos Sophia because he sees that Christ and Sophia are really connected, uh, that Jesus is, in fact, a masculine incarnation of the feminine divine. If, you've, if you're interested in following that up, read Cynthia Bourgeau's The Wisdom Jesus, where she makes this case that Jesus is part of this feminine movement in Jewish history. Yeah, so why are these translations wrong? Two reasons. One, I'm telling you. <laughs> and two, they never asked me to begin with when they first did it. So the, the reason, there's two kinds of mistranslating, let's say. So going from b to ba, from by means of to in the, that is, I mean, I, you have to like guess why people made that shift. But for some reason, because in Judaism you get both, but the text is the B, um, you do get, like I'm reading a Jewish translation, it says in the beginning. People are looking for a more solid, this is it. And so the translators went in that direction. The same thing with Hevel, whoever translated Ecclesiastes, he, under, and I'm assuming it was a guy, but he... Want, he felt the world was vain and human effort was futile. And so he read that into the text. So I think what happens is that people have a mindset and they read it into the text. That's one kind of mistranslation. Another kind of mistranslation is clearly political. So when King James orders the King James Bible to be written, and, and you know, having an English Bible was, was anathema to the the. the, the church. They didn't want people to read the Bible. But when King, the reason King James made, you know, um, paid for or hired the people to write the King James Version is because he didn't like the English versions that were coming out. And one of the changes that he made, if, if, I'm, if my information is correct, is in the Lord's Prayer, where we read, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. The Greek could have been read, forgive us our debts as we forgive those indebted to us, King James was completely freaked out about the idea that God wanted debts forgiven because the entire economy uh, was based on, on, on debts. So it, it could be a political, a political thing. Um, from, from my perspective, the idea is to hold as many of these things in your head at the same time. I'm just trying to point out ways of reading these texts that you haven't heard before. And, and, and next week will be even more bizarre than this week. <laughs> yeah. So this goes to that. When was it changed from the Because the St. James Version does say, the Lord said to me in the beginning of the 
No, his way is fine. It's the me. So, so when she, I, yeah, I don't know if you can tell in the English, uh, unless there's a pronoun that says she or her. The change happens somewhere in the intertestamental period, where you've got, in the, and it happens in the Greek, it doesn't happen in the, English, in the um, Hebrew, but where this word logos takes over for Sophia. And, and I can't tell you when that actually happens. I know you can see it in Philo, that he starts using logos rather than Sophia. Uh, and why that is, now I I'm only guessing, it's because the, the masculine culture just couldn't have, didn't have room for a feminine power like this. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that's the best I can do. But that, that's happening, you know, BCE, before the Christian era. Um, got a couple, I got time for maybe one or, yeah. Right. Oh, there's tons of words, yeah. <laughs> right. Okay, so the question is, <clears throat> you know, I, I made the, the numerological case that the rabbis make that Elohim, plural God, gods, uh, is the number 86, which it is, and Hateva, the natural world, is 86. And then the, the comment first was, well, are those the only two words that add up to 86? Of course not. There are dozens of words. You pick the one that, that you want. I mean, that's what makes commentators commentators. They have an idea. They know what they want to hear, unless it, they fall into the sowed and they get a new revelation. Otherwise, they're trying to make the Bible say what they want the Bible to say. And so they pick the word they want. This is the word I like, so this is the word I share with you. Um, but then they, the question is, what do I think about numerology? So numerology as a way of kindling your, your imagination to come up with all kinds of new readings of a, of a text like the Bible, I think it's fantastic. Uh, I think it's just another, um, imagine, another trigger for, for the human imagination. Numerology telling you the truth about stuff, I'm not going to go there. Right? That's not my thing. But if it, if it opens your imagination to see new dimensions in the Bible that you hadn't seen before, then yeah, that's, that's how the rabbis used it, and that's how I use it. Last question, and then I'm going to have to let you go because someone else is coming in. Yeah. <laughs> okay. My podcasts, I have two. One, you get, uh, one is called Essential Conversations. And if you, you just go to your podcast app and you, it says search and you put in essential conversations with Rabbi Rami and it'll pop up. That one is sponsored by Spirituality and Health magazine. It comes up every, comes out every two weeks. And the other one is called Conversations on the Edge. The producer dropped the Holy Rascal title and just went with Conversations on the Edge. And that's a weekly podcast and you just put that in the search engine. And, and it'll pop up. So thank you for, for the, the opportunity to advertise. <clears throat> okay, we're going to have to let this go. Was this interesting? Because, thank you, because we got five more weeks of it. So. <laughs>